Welcome, everybody, to the Illusion of Consensus podcast. I'm Professor Jay Bhattacharya. I'm here today with Professor Steve Hankey from, um, from uh, Johns Hopkins University. Steve has uh, become a friend of mine during the pandemic, uh, and uh, I've, I've learned a lot from his work uh, over the years, but, but certainly during the pandemic, it's, he's been a, a lodestar for the evaluation of how effective lockdowns were. Um, but Steve has a, has a, a long is a long history in in economics. Steve, welcome to the show, and thank you for uh, for joining me. Well, Jay, it's great to be with you. It, as one of my collaborators, <laughs> it's great to be with you in person. I mean, I, it's it, it's been one of these the, the one of these things where, like, the last five years, I've got to know many people that I that I just read about in books and you know read read uh, read their work and you're 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 one of them um how, steve uh, first why don't you introduce yourself to the to, to, to the folks uh you're, you've been a, a professor of economics at hopkins for a long time focusing I, I thought mostly on macro policy well actually it's interesting because i i i when i was a graduate student at the university of colorado in boulder i i had the good fortune to land a job as an assistant professor at the Colorado School of Mines. And I, I, that opportunity arose. I was only a second-year student. I, I, I was supposed to be the chief teaching assistant at the University of Colorado. Uh, that was great. But I, I hadn't even finished my courses. And a week before classes began at the Colorado School of Mines, the professor of economics in charge dropped over dead with a heart attack and they, they were desperate. So they, they called the University of Colorado, and, and my per, Professor Garnsey, the head of the department, called me in and said, look, this is, this is a great deal. You, you'd be an assistant professor. You're, you're actually going to be paid more than the assistant professors at the University of Colorado. And, and I said, I don't know how I can do this because I, I, I have a full load of graduate courses uh, I, I'd have to commute down to Golden, Colorado, three days a week, teach principles of economics. And he says, oh, I think you can do it, Steve. He said, plus, you'll learn a lot of economics. <laughs> that, that was his key line. He says, plus, you'll learn a lot of economics, which he was right. So I, I went to the Colorado School of Mines, a great school. It's the world's number one mining school, by the way. And the students were great. And... The first year, I just taught principles of economics. The next two years, I started teaching mineral economics and petroleum economics. And then 1969 I mean, rolled around. I'd finished my PhD. Uh, it's just, just for context for listeners, those are, those are really mi- microeconomics-heavy fields. Like you need to know oh. a lot of statistics. You know, need to a lot of, like, uh, 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 of uh, sort of the tools of microeconomics. Oh, not, it's not total, just, totally uh, micro. It's, it's totally su- supply and demand on steroids kind of thing. <laughs> so, right. so, so at any rate, uh, my dissertation was the first time anyone was able to measure and calculate what they call price elasticities for demand associated with the installation of water meters. Before you have a water meter, of course, you don't pay any. The price is zero. You put in a water meter, and they charge you per cubic meter per gallon, and you have a positive price. Well, the question is, how sensitive is that price going from zero to whatever the positive level is? So that, that was my dissertation. It was, it was pioneering. It was the first measurement like that anyone had ever done. And it's exactly what they wanted at Johns Hopkins in, in what was in the Department of Sanitary Engineering. So I, I became a professor of applied economics in the engineer, in engineering. And what I was doing is, is actually very, very micro things like designing water systems, like, like figuring the optimal diameter of pipes that should be used. So that's about as micro as you can get. <laughs> So, so the point is that you'd had you'd had this background in microeconomics, and you spent, of course, a, a, a illustrious have spent a illustrious and continue to spend an illustrious career in macroeconomics. But you'd had this deep background in microeconomics to start. Uh, the, the the COVID pandemic arri- arrives, and um, you know most economists, I have to say, I, I wrote a piece uh, excoriating economists, uh, Steve, because I was so unhappy with how economists performed during the pandemic. Uh, many of them, um, their their view was that uh, that. The lockdowns actually could not, in, even in theory, have any effect because p- 
people would have voluntarily locked themselves away because they were scared uh, it, it, just, it, of, the, of the, the threat of disease. And so the formal lockdown had no marginal impact. Well, uh, that was the reasoning that I saw from some economists early, and I was just I was just, just aghast at, at the shallowness of the reasoning. Well, the the uh, the thing is, by the way, uh, classes have actually just started at Johns Hopkins, and as a footnote, I, I'm in my fifty fifth year at Hopkins. Now, in addition to the Colorado School of Mines, I, I was out in your neck of the woods. I actually was on the faculty of the University of California at Berkeley for one year, but I I decided I. I, I, I had a preference for the East Coast rather than the West. Let's put it that way. So I came back to Hopkins, and I, I, I've been here, of course, ever since. But, but at any rate, the, the idea here and the relevant thing is measurement. That The, the, the key, you you got to get down to where the rubber meets the road. So you say, well, what, what's an economist like you ha, have an interest in anything about lockdowns and the effect of lockdowns? Well, it's kind of like measuring the price elasticity for water for the installation of waters. You, you, you have an event. The event is the installation of the water meter. And, and so you have consumption before the event and consumption after the event. And the only thing really that's changing from an economic point of view is the price. So you figure out how elastic the thing is. So, so that goes back to, to that. What, what was the event? COVID lockdowns. So what, what was going on with excess mortality before the lockdown and what, what was happening after? It's called an event study. We, they, they, we do this in the financial markets all the time with stocks. You know, they, they come out with earnings reports. That's the event. And, and did the earnings report change the trajectory of prices in any way? So, so that, that was, that's kind of the technical part of the thing, Jay. But the, the key thing, what, what motivated me to get involved in COVID and, and, the, and epidemiological studies and things like that? Well, the motivation came from Sweden. And, and Sweden uh, had, had a, a, a very light touch in terms of the lockdowns. And, it, and at that time, the, the doctor that was in charge of all public health things and, and public policy there was Anders Tegnell. And Tegnell was getting hammered and Sweden was getting hammered because they weren't doing what the epidemiological public health people were saying to do. They, they were saying lockdowns or you're going to be you're going to be destroyed if you're not locked down. Tegnell said no, we're not, we're not going to lock down. Uh, we're going to have a light touch and and uh, the press was just filled with every everyone piling on Sweden. So I called Lars Jonig, who's a, a very famous professor of actually uh, economics in Lund, Sweden, and and I know him because we've written three books together on on what on currencies and currency reforms. So I called Lars. I says, "What's going on over there, Lars?" And and he said, "Well." He said, we, we aren't locking down and so forth, but we, we should really look into what's going on. So we, we started looking into it, and we found that the Swedish Constitution of 1634 would have made lockdowns, heavy lockdowns, illegal. And, 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 and Lars and I wrote an article in May of 2020 in the Wall Street Journal about this. No, no one picked up on it. They didn't want to pick up on it. They, they didn't want to, anyone to conclude that what Sweden was doing with a light touch and no lockdowns was, was consistent with the Swedish constitution. And if they would have locked down, it would have been unconstitutional, by the way. Let, let me just read you, let me read this oh, sentence about that from that 1634 constitution. I'm quoting, everyone shall be protected in their relations with public institutions against the deprivations of personal liberty. So the personal liberty part, if you go into the Constitution carefully in Sweden, you, you can't interfere with Swedes' movement. They can move around freely, and it's in the Constitution, by the way. So, 
so that's why lockdowns would, would have been unconstitutional. So you know, there's 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 a couple of things I wanted to unpack there because those I think you may raise some very very interesting points. So so first of all, in the um, the, the the use of event studies to evaluate the effect of lockdowns. That's a very, very empirical approach. But the other the alternative approach that other, some economists, a lot of epidemiology were focused on was a, was essentially like a, 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 a modeling exercise, it seemed to me, where they, they thought that they had a mathematical model, a, a computer game almost, of how humans interact with each other. Um, and then they they would run run counterfactual simulations on the computer computer events where they a computer a com- the, the computer study where in one version of it everyone just interacts with each other c- closely in another the, the probability of interactions are very low and then from that they concluded the lockdowns worked but you're talking about an empirical evaluation about of lockdowns looking at what happened in Sweden which didn't really lock down didn't op- didn't close schools for kids under 16 those are two very very different approaches to evaluating the effect of a policy oh a- absolutely this is the key point you're raising one, one is called a- ex ante modeling you 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 de- design a model you pl- uh, plug various input data into it and run the thing and 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 that will project uh, and give you a forecast for the effects of lockdowns or or not locking down. If you don't lock down, this many people will die. That's what the model tells you. But the, but that's before anything happens. the The event study is ex post. It's actually measuring what what did happen. We're not forecasting what's going to happen. We're we're measuring what actually did happen. Which, which I'll get into in just, just one second, but th- that thought is the key, the key thing. All these epidemiological models are ex ante models that forecast excess deaths, for example. Or if you change the model and you plug in lockdowns, they, 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 they will tell you how many excess de- how many deaths will be reduced because of the lockdown. That you plugged into the model, you you didn't plug it into anything in the real world. You plugged it into a model. So yeah. so so, so, let, like, let's, so let's let's move fast forward and, and get off the Sweden thing. Specific. Oh, I, I, I love. <laughs> let's stay on Sweden for just a little longer. I love it's my well, favorite country that, well, nowadays. It, 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 if you look at the excess deaths, this is ex post facto. Now, after everything that's happened, we had this storm in the Sweden. We had the, the press piling on Tegnell and the Swedes, uh, er, every magazine in the world, they, they were saying, this is nuts. This is going against the, what the epidemiologists are saying they should be doing and so forth and so on. As it turns out, the light touch, the excess deaths in Sweden are very low. And, and Now, you can measure excess deaths, as you well know, in, in different ways. But, but by all measures, they ended up being very low in Europe, very, very low. And, and by some measures, the excess deaths were actually the lowest in Sweden of any so kind. So just, just, un- just to unpack that, just so the listeners can understand, um, the way that, how do you measure excess deaths? For, to, to get it, you have to look at how many deaths there actually were, but then you have to have some expectation how, how many there would have been in the absence, you know, if, 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 if the, if the if pandemic had not arrived. Right. right. Exactly. So, so, and so the reason why you might see different measures of excess deaths is that different people may have different ways of getting, getting that expectation. Right. So for instance, one standard way I've seen, or one way I've seen is look how many deaths a country had in 2015 to 2019 by age or something. And that, and then project forward and say, okay, they would have had roughly the same number of deaths uh, it, it, you know, given the structure of the population as they had in that at that at that rate in, in 2015 to 2019, if only the pandemic had not arrived. Yes. And then, they, then once you have that, you subtract. Yeah. And that's the, excess death. The, the reason for the different measurements, it, it, it's using slightly technical jargon, but the, the base can be different. In other words, you, you, you gave a hypothetical between 2000, whatever, 15 and whatever the number was. But what if we had a longer period of time? Maybe we'd have a different base. And, and then right. if we look at what actually happened with deaths relative to that base, it, it would be different depending on whether the base was different or not. The number of deaths is the same, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> and the key thing you're saying is that almost no matter how you reasonably define the base, 
Sweden comes out among the very best in Europe. And in many cases, in many cases, depending on the base again, they're the best, uh, they, they, they protected human life better than any other country in Europe. Yes, that's, that's right. Now, that's one thing, and we're going to get to this, I think, in our conversation, but do you find that much in the press? No. <laughs> this, is, this, this is self-censorship going on. The, the press was all over Sweden, and, and now you, you can hardly find this. It is reported occasionally. The Economist magazine had a good survey of, of this, for example, and, and there are various other things. But the, main, the mainstream press... In, in the West, this does not cover this story at all. Oh, it's, it's at all. Steve, it's even worse. There's a there's a reporter or at the LA Times or op ed writer or whatever. I'm not sure what he is. Um, named Michael Hiltzik, who who published pieces in 2023 as late as 2023, saying that Sweden was the among the worst countries in the world in terms of, and he explicitly yeah, well, it, ignores it, 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 uh, the, this fact. What, what we're getting at here, a lot of the mainstream media it, it actually produces a lot of what 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 generically is called fake news. And, and, and this is why Hanky's 95% rule is 95% of what you read in the press is either wrong or irrelevant. So that, that's one, that's one take, take away that's very important. Now, now let's jump ahead. So, so Yonig and I got on this thing in Sweden. And then, and then the next thing is we, we said, well, we should really be measuring something. I mean, we're both measurement guys, and so we 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 talked about this for a while, and we found uh, a, a, a Danish scholar who was working heavily on what was going on in the Scandinavian countries. It, it, his name is Jonas Herbe. So Jonas Herbe, Lars Jonig, and yours truly decided that we would do what's called a meta analysis, and a, and a meta analysis. It's what they used to call in the old days a review of the literature. <laughs> so, so what, what, what we what we started we we looked at twenty thousand articles, a little over twenty thousand articles, and and the meta analysis tries to find high quality empirical research that that can be normalized, so you can compare things. You can compare apples to apples. So, so out Steve, of the just just just. Just to, just to set the stage, you're saying, but by what 2021, 2022, 20,000 articles had been published trying to, in some some way, evaluate what impact the lockdowns had had on some some sets of outcomes, like the number of cases, the number of deaths, so on. Correct. So out of the 20, but not all. But let's let's apply your 95 percent rule. Does that apply to papers? Well, listen to here. Here's what you get. When we went into these, we we found 32 that were high quality. Out of 20,000. Out of 20,000, we found two. Thir, 32 could have potentially be used for for an empirical meta analysis. Out of those, we we ended up with 22. So so we went I, from so 20,000. Can, can I give you some sense? about why like why what what is it about this one i mean so, sometimes you do a search and that you get a lot of things that are not exactly exactly what you are looking for uh, so that you know you could you could exclude it for that well, let, let's, but what, what, what are examples of low quality papers in well, this field well n- num- number one they, they might really not even contain data maybe they're just an opinion piece about lockdowns uh pie in the sky kind of stuff you know you get, you get a lot of them are in that category so you just throw them out immediately be, but but then we you you've you've got to have hardcore empirical data that 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 is that has been dealt with in a in a afraid to use almost a, a scientific way you know properly and 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 uh, and and out of the 20,000, we came down with 32. Then out of those, there were problems with some, with, with about 10 of them, because, and they, they, we couldn't normalize them for comparative purposes. If we had kept all 32, we had had, had some apples and oranges in there. It, 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 would, it would have been a problem. So we had 22 clean studies that could be actually compared to each other. And, and, and so that, that and, is and the studies we were looking at, the, the all st- those studies that you, you kept in, ultimately, they're all looking at the impact of lockdown 
on all cause death, not just on COVID deaths, because there's a lot of controversy over how, uh, or controversy, there's a lot of differences across countries in how COVID cases or COVID deaths were counted, right? Some countries uh, like China, uh, for a long time, I think that they had, a, you were only a COVID death if you had clinical characteristics of COVID verified by CT scan, for instance. This is before they had the PCR test. Um, other countries, uh, they differed on how long before you died, you had to have a positive COVID test. Like I think in the United States, it was like, I, I don't know the exact number, but like 28 days or something. If you had a positive COVID test and then you died, you were assumed to have died from COVID, even if you may have died from something else, just with COVID being incidental. You avoid all that by just looking at all cause death. You don't need to worry about the specific cause of death, right? So those you were, you were focused on studies that were looking at, at all cause death. So the, what, what did we end up with? We, we ended up that the, the lockdowns had, had a, really a very small effect. So we, we, the event study was the lockdown comes in and, 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 and does it save lives? And in the United States, we, we d- depending on the severity of the of the, of the lockdown in, imposed, we we ended up with. I'm just going to give the average now, rather than getting. Think about about ten thousand deaths were saved, lives were saved, lives were saved because of the lockdown. Now, to, to put this into context, and the reason that that's a small, it's a it's a big number if you happen to be one of the 10,000. But the regular flu season, how many people die in the United States? 38,000. So flu kills more people, four times more people, than were saved by the imposition of lockdowns in the United States. So just, just to, I want to be as precise as we can be. When you say saved... What you're looking at is studies that look at the short run effect of the lockdowns that happened in March or April 2020. Yes, and you're not looking at long run. Like you're not like these people. These 10,000 aren't going to live forever. Uh, you're looking at. You're asking the question: How many more people would have been alive at the end of May 2020, April, uh, June 2020, had we not had a lockdown? And the answer in the United States is in in a, in a population of 300 and some million, um, 350 million. You'd save ten thousand people. Yes, yeah. That let's say that's the average of the. It, depending on how you measure it, there's a range. So this this would be kind of the midpoint, shall we say? Yeah, the midpoint. I mean, obviously there's some yeah, uncertainty because yeah, you're yeah, you know, yeah, people yeah. are measuring differently. But let me ask one other, one other point about this. You're not asking what are the longer run consequences of lockdown. No, this this, really- this this working paper that we did, by the way, what what we published as a Johns Hopkins working paper. In the studies and applied economics series that I edit, we, we published that in January of 2022. So the pandemic didn't start till February of 2020. So this is this is really the uh, shall we, as you put it, kind of short run effects, right? Kind of kind of an immediate thing. Now let let's talk talk about Europe. We we looked at what was going on in Europe, and there. About fourteen thousand five hundred, on average, deaths were avoided because of lockdowns. The regular flu season, seventy-two thousand people die in Europe of flu. A lot of people die, so about five times more people die of flu in Europe than were saved by lockdowns. So that's that's what okay. we found. Now, now that finding that was published in that Johns Hopkins working paper in January of 2022 ended up creating a, a big stink because one of my colleagues... Okay, before, actually, before we get to that stink, because I want to spend a lot of time th- talking about that stink and also about the, the censorship of that exact piece. But I want to, before, just before we move on, I want to talk a little bit about why is that number what it is? Like, why is it um, why isn't it that it saved you know uh, hundreds of thousands of people in the United States? Why why is it only why is it only ten thousand? Oh well, um, yeah. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that's not specifically in the review, but I'd love to hear your thoughts about why were lockdowns so ineffective at saving human life, even in the short uh, run. Okay, the, the, and this this does come into these epidemiological models. Remember the the the, the big model for the United States was produced by the Imperial College of London. Professor Ferguson was in charge of that. Well, we'll get into this in detail later. But but Ferguson's 
epidemiological model said that if they did not lock down, there'd be 2.17 million deaths. 2.17 million. That was the model. That was the ex ante model. Within, uh, it's just like, like that's in April and May 2020 we're talking yes. about. Like so they were predicting 2 million deaths in the U.S. If they did not lock down. Short, if, if, not, if they didn't lock down. Okay, now, now we get to your qu- answer to your question. And the difference between the ex ante 2 million number, a little over 2 million, and, 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 the, and the reality of, of 10,000, that's, that's a big difference. Now, why is that? That's, that's because the epidemiological models don't include behavioral variables. You talked about that early on. People, people adjust to something. It's what I call a hot stove effect. If, if, if somebody in, in the room, you're in, you're in the kitchen with your wife, and, and, and she says, Jay, be careful, that stove's hot. What, what do you do? You don't put your hand on the stove, for God's sakes. You stay away from that thing. You can probably even leave the kitchen. So th- this kind of behavioral effect is that people adjust. Once they detect danger, they try to avoid it. And, and by the way, the Spanish flu in the United States, there's a, this is a great example of this. The Spanish flu in the United States, it hit, it hit first in New York City. It hit very hard. There were a lot of deaths. And, and then that news went out over the wires in those days and, and was reprinted in the press. And, 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 and as the flu moved from, the, from New York uh, all the way out to San Francisco, there was a gradient, and the, and the de- rate of deaths were going down, 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 because people had time to adjust. So, so it's yeah, that, Steve, it's, that it's, behavioral it's thing is not that kind of adjustment is is typically not included in these epidemiological models. And so, the, I, I mean, I think that that is a it's a very important point, um, and I, and I think it certainly undercuts the the accuracy of those models. But I, but I want to say one thing about about the Swedish response because uh, some some economists uh, like Phil Magnus, I think took the Imperial College model framework, the, the, the actual model itself, and applied it to Sweden. And with that model, I think they predicted something like there'd be 100,000 deaths in Sweden if there was no lockdown in the short, in the, you know, in the, in the two months after April, uh, March and April 2020, something like that. Um, in, in the two months, the, the model predicted 100,000 deaths in Sweden. But in fact, in those months, Sweden had, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, something like that, that deaths. It was one, you know, uh, off by two orders of ma- – the, the model was off by two orders of magnitude. And I think that you're, you're exactly right that the, the response that people have – I mean, if you say that there's a deadly infectious disease going around, people will change their behavior. Um, one other point before I let you, let you uh, go, go on. Um, I don't know that it's evenly distributed in the population, the capacity to, to, to lock down, right? If you have a – um, a nice home. Um, you 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 have internet in the home. You you have people can get to del- deliver. You have it, you're rich enough so people can deliver groceries to you, um, or you have kids that can deliver groceries to you. Um, that's one thing. But then there are other lots of folks who don't have those kinds of means. Who actually they need to be physically in person because their job can't be replaced by remote. Um, that capacity to 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 lock down is is. Is actually, it's only I think a relatively small fraction of the world population that has that capacity to lock themselves away for a very long period of time. Yeah, the the, the only place where we did see the full capacity in use was in China. <laughs> when when they when they locked you down, you, you you stayed in your apartment and and you and you starved basically if, 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 at the extreme. So it, it, yeah. it, they, they, so they're. There are degrees of lockdown, and, and we measured that, by the way. That, that's why I, I said I gave you an average number for the 10,000. There was a range depending on how severe the measurement of lockdowns uh, actually was. Now, back to the Imperial College of London, because that's where most of the gold standard modeling is actually done with these epidemiological models. And, and so they, they're very influential and very powerful. 2001, 
the model for foot and mouth disease indicated that 450 people would die from foot and mouth. Actually, 50 did. So they said 450 ex ante, ex post 50. Then 2002 rolled around, and the mad cow, their model, the Imperial College of London and Ferguson said 150,000 would die. Actually, 178 died. Then the big one, 2005, bird flu, remember that? They, they said that 200 million people would die of bird flu. 200 million in the world would die. 16 years later, only 400 and 456 died. Then, then 2009, swine flu. They said 65,000 would die. Actually, 500 died. So you can see the calibration of these models is, is you know, I would say ridiculous. You can, you can throw them in the rubbish, basically. But, but what happened? What happened? The lockdown madness spread when the Imperial College of London report came out. And remember, for the U.S., what, what were the number of deaths if you didn't lock down? 2.17 million people. So th this is, these are giant fear machines, basically. And, 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 and once, the, once the, the fear goes in, you, you get what? Boris Johnson, the next day after that model came out, they locked the UK down. And, I had a, a, and, a meeting. And, and by the way, it starts. The UK is very important because of the BBC broadcast in over 400 different languages, and they're reporting all this Imperial College of London stuff night, morning till night. Hi, everyone. A quick recommendation. I just saw a great film on YouTube called Medicating Normal. It's about the growing trend to medicate mental distress with powerful psychiatric drugs like Prozac, Xanax, Seroquel, and Adderall. For some people, once on these drugs, they're almost impossible to get off, and they have devastating side effects. The film tells the story of people whose lives were ruined by taking these common prescriptions. Watch a trailer and the award-winning film on medicatingnormal.com. That's Medicating Normal, medicating with an I-N-G at the end, normal.com. Our show notes and newsletter will have information on how to find the film. There's also a YouTube channel. Don't miss it. Check out the link in the description below. Thanks. You know, I had a meeting with President Trump in the Oval Office in August of 2020. Uh, and one of the questions he asked me was, did he save 2 million lives by locking the country down in March of 2020? He, he was under the impression in August of 2020 that he had saved 2 million people by locking down. That's, that's, that's how, that's how it works. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 I, and now, now we're, we're, now, now we're getting into, let, let's, 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 let's go to the stink that was associated with the first publication of our meta analysis. So, okay. So, so just, just the timeline, this is in 2022, you're looking back at the 20,000 some papers that are published in the scientific literature You've identified the highest quality papers that that, that have that fo focus on this. You've identified that the the, the the average estimate is that ten thousand lives were saved by the lockdowns in the short months after uh, they were imposed in twenty twenty. Um, uh, you're not looking at the long run effects. You publish. You're you're a Hopkins professor for. 50, how long? I've, I've been at Stanford for forty years. Yeah, so you, well, fifty five is impressive yeah, to yeah, me. I'm, uh, even. I'm, so I'm, I'm out in front of you, Jay. <laughs> uh, so, so, and and you have a you have a, a distinguished professor uh, in from Sweden in, in Lars. You have this young, uh, sort sort of mathematically inclined um, uh, economist who's 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 a very promising. Um, uh, in 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 Jonas, you three put together this paper in 2022, and you put it out under uh, a, something called a working paper series, right? So that's like a, a something that's not yet been through the peer review process but you put it out under the under your uh, from your from your uh, from your your university Johns Hopkins University yeah it, and, uh, the, and, the the institute which i founded and and co-direct the institute for applied economics global health and the study of business enterprise so that was in january then comes the 2nd of february that that year you know uh, but like less than a, just a few days afterwards uh, after that was published Dr. Marty McCary, who's a professor of medicine 
at Johns Hopkins, very very prominent professor, uh, it was on Tucker Carlson's program back in those days. Tucker Carlson was on Fox, as you recall, and and Marty said, "It's amazing." He said, "The biggest news of the day, no one's reporting on it." And and Carlson said, "Well, what what do you mean the biggest news? What is it?" And he said, "It's this study that Herbie Yonig and Hankey did." published at Johns Hopkins, indicating that these lockdowns have a tiny effect on health, on mortality, on, on deaths. They're saving very few people. So that that was the, 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 the cat was out of the bag then when Marty uh, McCary was on Fox and, and did that. The next day, it was brought up at the White House briefing room, our, our study, they were asked about it. And Everybody on, on Capitol Hill, the congressmen, especially the ones who, who were obviously against lockdowns, were waving this study around and everything. And then one day later, the counterattack occurred, February 3. So Marty was on February 2. February 3, after this White House news conference and everything, the Science Media Center in London, which is, which is con- really controlled by the Imperial College of London and uh, the Ferguson and, and his colleagues, uh, they put out a press release. And, and the press release, uh, you know, was slamming our study. Three of the people responding were professors from the Imperial College of London. One, Professor Patton, is not from the Imperial College of London. He was on the press release, and he, he didn't slam us. He said, uh, he said that, that our study was a significant, I'm quoting, a significant contribution to our understanding of lockdown effects. So, so that was Professor Patton. You had Ferguson, Flaxman, and I, I can't remember, there was another uh, professor that, that were going over our paper and, and slamming it in a way, but, but kind of in a, in a childish way, they they said this was just a working paper. It wasn't peer reviewed. Well, all, no no working papers. You know very well there are working papers series all over the place. They're not peer reviewed. The whole idea huh. is to put up your working paper so you get comments, so you can improve things, and then and then get, get it into a peer reviewed journal. Eventually, I mean, it's, it, there's an irony here because I think that your paper had more eyes on it than almost any other economics paper written during the the the, the, the COVID era. Peers looked at it. I looked at it. I looked at it very carefully. Right? I, 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 we're now friends, but 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 then I, we were just peers, uh, and and I thought it was a very very highly uh, very, very very carefully done study. And there's some irony in having in who you said were in that press release, right? So you had uh, um, uh, you got Ferguson who you. I mean, effectively, you're criticizing his his work as a as a uh, as a method of measuring how many lives would be saved from a lockdown. Um, you have uh, uh, who, oh, so there's a second author, second person you said Flax- Seth Flax- Flaxman. Yeah, Flaxman had published a study in Nature using essentially something like the Imperial College model, r- running it with and without lockdowns, and and, and effectively. Uh, using the, the 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 modeling counterfactual rather than the real world counterfactual uh, to measure the effectiveness of the 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 effectiveness of lockdowns at saving lives, they had a vested interest in your being wrong, Jonas. Uh, oh, Jonas, oh, oh yeah. It. Oh, oh, they had. There's no question about it. And 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 by the way, they they came out with that press release. And why did they do this? There there are several reasons. One. Johns Hopkins' name was associated with it. You had a professor from Johns Hopkins. Now, as anyone in the in the health field knows, Hopkins has a brand. It's big. Yeah. It's big, and, and so so that that was a real problem. The second thing, you had a Hopkins professor. Well, that that made it another problem. And and three, you you had it in the White House briefing room. And and and. and Within hours after that press release, you had a, a fact-checking outfit called Snoops. Snoops came out. They, they just basically repeated what was in the press release from the Science Media Center in London. And, the, and then USA Today fact-checkers got involved. All the fact-checkers got involved. But the fact-checkers, 
the the paper is highly technical, as you know. So fact checkers are are not competent even to read the. Th- they couldn't read it honestly. <laughs> they might be able to read the conclusions and and in a bottom line number, but they'd have no idea about the methodology that was used in the data or anything like that. So the fact checkers piled onto the thing, and uh, and, and 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 just swarmed on it. All the fact checkers, by the way, just repeated what the what the Snoop's fact checker said. So they 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 aren't even original. They did they the fact checkers just plagiarized off first the press release that was out of London, and and then the Snoop's report, which they had all kinds of stupid things. They said, "Oh, this couldn't be any good because three economists did it." <laughs> that was one of the big things. <laughs> Episode. I mean, the, the, the funny thing is, like, and, and, you have. And, you oh, have oh, by the way, just to, you'll, you'll appreciate this. Just one other thing to interrupt you. I apologize for that. The, no one worries, other yeah. critique was Hopkins didn't endorse the thing. Well, you know, Hopkins doesn't endorse anything. <laughs> Since when does Stanford University endorse what Jay Bhattacharya's journal articles are writing? It's just not part of the game. Well, it's, it's just, there's a, there's, okay. First, there's a level of, of, of like malice there to start with, which essentially like you had authors that were, that were conflicted, like directly conflicted. Your, your analysis was directly criticizing their work. The, the, they, they, they gin up a press release, which is not peer reviewed, uh, essentially saying that you're not peer reviewed. Yeah. Right. And then you have this like, uh, this, this sort of like, fact-checking enterprise, which is almost tailor-made never to find any true fact, uh, sort of copying the same uh, uh, conflicted criticism you got out of out of Imperial College. The whole enterprise is almost tailor-made. Also, it is tailor-made to create a narrative and to suppress the truth. Oh, it's, it's totally rigged. Out of all the fact-checkers, by the way, I, I, there was only one who ever had the, shall we say, courtesy to even contact me. And ask anything, so they they were just making this rubbish up out of thin air, and 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 a, a one hatchet job after another hatchet job. Now the interesting thing is the 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 mainline press n- never picked this working paper up. It, it, it there, was, there was never anything in the New York Times, the Wall Street. Well, the Wall Street Journal did pick it up actually. The Wall Street Journal published one one, one thing. They they never really followed up, but they did. They did publish one thing, just stating what we found, and 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 uh, Washington Post nothing. You mentioned the L.A. Times. The L.A. Times did a bunch of hatchet jobs, uh, just copying what the fact checkers were saying and 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 showing their ignorance. Basically, the, these people aren't even aware of the simple fact that working papers are by definition not peer reviewed. Big deal, right? And of course, they can't read the paper themselves and evaluate its quality. I mean, as I said, I read very carefully through through the paper. It had a big impact on my thinking. I mean, I I suspected that the estimates of lives saved from lockdowns based on those modeling exercises were off, in part because of the history. But when I read your paper, and I'd read some of the empirical papers that had tried to assess the lockdown uh, efficacy, and of course, I had been carefully following the Swedish example, which seemed like a direct counterexample to the idea that you needed lockdowns in order to save lives. And so when I read your paper, um, it was, it was really interesting because I want, I, it, it was, I, I didn't, I didn't know it before I read it about what the careful econometric literature had been finding when it, when they compared actual real world, uh, effects of lockdowns on life saving. Um, I published a paper in 2021, uh, looking at case spread, lockdowns and case spread. Again, again, an empirical paper with effectively an empiric, with a, with a kind of, a a uh, uh, uh sort of event study mechanism and we 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 were hard pressed to find any impact of the lockdowns on on case spread in the same time period um you know, again looking at, at at countries that did and didn't lock down um regions that had more severe lockdowns and regions that had less severe lockdowns um and so it was really striking that this high quality work that you'd produced evidently high quality if you know if you know how to read is being panned by people who are uh conflicted cuz they have a reputational stake in making sure that people think lockdowns save lives, a lot of lives, and also by the press, 
which just mimics the which just mimicked the the the, the absolute misinformation um, that you your study corrected. At, yeah, at, at least the press, if they were honest, they they would say, well, there are two different way, views on this. One, the Imperial College of London says this, and and this is how they're proceeding, but. Uh, Hanky and this Johns Hopkins team are s- is saying this is what they find when they actually measure it. So, so you got a big di- divergence of opinion, d- different approaches, and so forth. So eventually, let's jump ahead. So that was a working paper, and, and we we published then a second edition of the working paper after we received comments and so forth. And it was starting to get book length. So we we actually said, well, let's let's do a book. So we we did. And that book was peer-reviewed and published by the Institute for Economic Affairs in London. Uh, it, it, you can I- indicate to your viewers that that's free, by the way. You know, Milton Friedman, yeah. used always, Milton Friedman used to always say there's no such thing as a free lunch. Well, there actually is a free book, <laughs> and, you can, <laughs> and you can get it. I- at the institute, I mean, I, 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 uh, I, I, I confess, I downloaded. It. I'm not sure where I can donate to, but it was, it's a. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, it was. I, th- I think, I think you, uh, I, I think that 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 book is is nice because it does respond to some of the criticisms that you got, l- like l- legitimate criticisms that you got from the working paper. It addresses, I think, those pretty squarely. Well, we we address those, and we have two appendices in there that get into this counterattack against us and the the fact checking and how how that all of that works. So, if if somebody's interested, they can, they can get into it in those appendices. But the, but the thing can I, can I ask the, one, the one thing, thing that's in, 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 in yeah, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Steve. So, well, I was going to ask about you per- personally. What because I've been through this kind of attack several times during the pandemic. Uh, this kind of like noise machine attack. Personally, what was that like for you? Oh, I'm used to this kind of stuff. I remember during the Asian <laughs> financial crisis, I was President Suharto's chief economic advisor in Indonesia. And 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 I I had proposed a currency board reform that would have stabilized the rupiah and and smashed inflation and and stabilized everything in Indonesia. Well, the United States wanted to get rid of Suharto. They wanted the Asian financial crisis to take him out. So they they Bill Clinton was in charge of this, and and I, actually I was on the other end of the line three times. Clinton was on telling Suharta, if if you do Hankey's reform, you're not getting the $43 billion. But if you want to go back and, and look at, at, at hatchet jobs and that kind of thing, you, you, you go back and you can look at that. Plus the fact that in Yugoslavia, remember, I was the chief economic advisor in the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia from January 1990 until the Civil War broke out in May of 1991. So I, I, I was in, 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 in the Balkans. And then eventually I became the chief economic advisor and state counselor for the Republic of Montenegro, which, which, which was still part of the rump Yugoslavia, by the way, in 1999 when I was the state counselor there. And what we did, we did a currency reform. We said, Let's let's get rid of the hyperinflating Yugoslav dinar and we'll replace it with a German mark. That was a hanky plan. It crushed hyperinflation. It it got rid of the uh, obviously the Yugoslav dinar, but Slobodan Milosevic was the president of the rump Yugoslavia, and a target was put on my back. And and this is this is all public and everything else. They, they they never got me, but they tried. So so I you had, you had I, a I, young co-author, right? Was uh, a, this uh, was a, I would put it this way: in the scale of things I've been involved with, this is kind of a minor footnote, personally. Um, is it the the, the um? But you also had a junior co-author, right? Uh, Jonas Serbi was that was a junior co-author. I mean, was it whether? Uh, how did it impact him? Do you think? I, I think I think more so because, uh, as you say, he's younger than I am and uh, he hasn't developed scar tissues as I have. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I I I I I think it it it, it always it, it rattles your cage a little bit if somebody's attacking you and 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 if you know very well that it's a rigged game 
and they're publicly attacking you with, with phony information and so forth. It, it, you know, you, you can't say you just ignore it. You, it, it, it yeah. you know, it, it comes up on your radar screen, and you, I, I saw a little blip, uh, and I think Jonas Herbie's blip was probably bigger than mine, and and, uh, uh, and, and oh, Lars yeah. Yoning maybe was somewhere in between. Lars Yoning's a very experienced man, by the way. He was Carl Bildt. Carl Bildt was the prime minister of Sweden in the early 1990s, and, and his chief economist was Lars Yoning. So, so you know, Yoning's been around the block. He, he, he has some idea of what, what's going on. You but, all had, at least you has scar tissue. <laughs> yeah, right. So let's, let's get to the Institute for Economic Affairs book. So, so that book, did have an impact. One one of the ministers of uh, uh, MPs, uh, ministers, uh, Steve Baker, uh, contacted me, and, and he he was very impressed by the study. We we actually wrote an op-ed in the Times of London, Steve Baker and I, summarizing our findings that that basically Johnson and and by the way, uh, Baker's a Tory, so 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 he was criticizing Johnson. The, the prime minister who, who in, imposed all these lockdowns and silliness. So we, we wrote that in August of 2022 in the Times of London. And then in January of 2024, Baker uh, requested that that book be entered into evidence in the UK COVID inquiry that Baroness Hallett was chairing. And, and they stonewalled us. They, 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 they. We, we have a minister requesting in a in a long single spaced one page letter that this be entered into evidence. They, they came back and said, "Well, Professor Hale has already testified on this," and I looked over his testimony, 110 pages. He didn't testify on anything we said. He never referred to our book or anything. It, it just disappeared. So. So that was. Let me add one more data point to that. Uh, that in that inquiry, Baroness Hallett had. Um, they never invited Sunetra Gupta, the co-author from mine of mine at, at Oxford University of the of the Great Barrington Declaration. And and uh, I mean, you know, of course, Johnson did not follow her advice to, to not lock down in 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 twenty in late twenty twenty or uh, September October twenty twenty. Uh, they locked down anyways. She's a major player, major ac- academic, major thinker in this, and yet the co- the UK COVID inquiry did not invite her to testify. Well, I didn't know that until you just mentioned it, but th- this none, none of this surprises me. They they just this is this is a, a self censorship rigged thing, and and the purpose of UK inquiries is uh, obviously to shove things under the rug, which which they did basically. They they never they never got to the fundamental question. They had fifty questions for the inquiry, and and they never had the key question. The key question is: Did lockdowns work? The title of our book. They never asked the question. <laughs> yeah, because they didn't want the answer, did they? They didn't want the answer. Now, now, by the way, uh, just to further how this system works. So, we we shortened the book in, into a. A more of an academic length article type thing and and we were recommended that we submit that to a journal called inquiry which is published by sage publishers and and they the editor is umer safiki and 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 this is an interesting episode we submitted our paper yonig uh, her herbie yonig and hanky we submit the paper we get three favorable reviews, the usual kind of academic thing. We, we accept this on conditional that they tweak this, that, and the other thing. You, you've done this a million times. So, so that, that, that was received under the signature of Safiki. I, I received it. I, I, I received it at 6.43 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. On May first, two thousand twenty-three. Then, on May first, two thousand twenty-three, at ten thirty-five a.m., I wrote him back and I said, after checking with Herbie and 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 Yonig, we can accommodate all the requests the reviewers have made, and 
and within a week we will submit re resubmit for publication. Then, on May first, two thousand twenty-three, one fifty p.m. About you know what what, what do we got here? Uh, right, three hours three later. hours later or something. I received a note from Safiki, Omer Safiki, the editor. He said he will have to, and I'm quoting, resend this decision that he sent earlier because he wanted to get two or three more reviews. So number one, the typical review number is about three. He had three good reviews. He rescinded the reviews. I, I've, ne I've, and I've never talked to an academic that ever has had reviews rescinded, but he rescinded it. He said he'd be back with two addition, two or three additional reviews in two weeks. I waited two months and wrote him, and I said, we don't have the re those extra reviews. He wrote me back, and he said, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to trash the paper. I was unable to get anyone to review it. And I wrote back, and I said, what do you mean? You already have three. <laughs> so so that that's what's going on. Now, now you and I wrote, we, we, I want when I said earlier on we were colleagues, we we're collaborators, we, we wrote an article in the September 2023 issue of Economic Journal Watch, and that was about the censorship you and I had, in, in, had experienced. Steve, can I, can, I set, can I set the stage for this? Yeah, I, you set I think the it's stage. For listeners to know. So um, – the the journals what you what you describe as journal that your experience as a journal that that some I mean I've I've had that occasionally happen in my career where the journal editor just I mean didn't act really quite ethically I mean the, and you you get jerked around um, but the pre there are preprint servers preprint servers are are places where there you can you can put your work out just like you said earlier for for your for your earlier work um, before the before the book there's a place where you can put your your thing you you, you did it through your Johns Hopkins University pre uh, preprint server um, where people uh, other scientists can look you're not it's not it's not making any claims to be peer reviewed it's just a, a clearinghouse for papers that are that are in progress um, and it's a perfectly normal part of the scientific process to put those papers in that and you had sent your uh, paper, the, the second version of that pa the, pa the paper after the book, um, to uh, to 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 uh, a social science preprint server, which where many 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 economists send their papers. I've I've sent many papers of mine there as well. Yes. Uh, now, what? what, what uh, and normally it's completely pro forma. You send the paper there. Oh, oh, a oh well, they, they 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 publish things that I, I they they I don't even send them. They pull off working papers of mine and they publish them and 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 send me notices that I'm in the top 10 of, of people that that have, that have they've SSRN. uploaded their papers yeah. you see. and I I've never submitted anything so in this case we did want to submit to the social science research network SSRN so we did and we kept getting responses and the response was well th this this paper deals with medical things with medical in the medical field, and we can't do it. But this this is the key. They did publish a paper that was an attack on our paper, the the paper that we <laughs> wouldn't publish. They, they, they and, and and they wouldn't publish it. They said because it was a, in in the medical field, not social science. Well, they did publish a paper that that was basically an attack on us. So they didn't. They they refused to publish. Your working paper, something that, they, that that just should have been pro forma under a, this crazy excuse that it's a medical. T I mean, is there is there more? It's hard to think of a of an econ, of, of a policy uh, that there's more like a single policy more, uh, other than short of war that has a bigger impact on how we, uh, on, on the on the, on on like health and and and, and economic outcomes than the lockdowns. Uh, yeah, and you're, yeah, a a absolutely. The lockdowns don't are, aren't related to economics. I mean, you must be kidding. One of the one of the biggest economic shocks in the history of the world. You know, <laughs> you know it's amazing. And so, the, but then, but then to, to then to rub salt on it, they publish the a, a, some some critique. Of it, yes. Instead of, and again, these are all non. This is not not. It's not peer review. These are just normally. It's just pro forma. They just 
put it up and people can can react and read to it. Yeah, well, not react tell, to it. Tell, tell your listeners how, how you and I got together because you, you what your experience was on your platform. Yeah, I mean, so I I had a very very similar experience. Um, so I mentioned earlier that that I'd written a paper. It was with John Ioannidis and Aaron Ben David at Stanford on. Uh, measuring the impact of the lockdowns on case spread. We published it eventually in uh, in a journal, in a peer review journal in 2021. Um, we tried actually to get it published as a preprint in something called Med Archive. Med Archive. It's very similar, I guess, in some sense to SSRN, but it's 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 even more permissive. Like you just send a paper there, you can look. There's like t- t- hundreds of thousands, mostly trashy papers, but like we wanted to send it there so that we could get some comments on on it. Um, Med Archive set, set, told us that they would not put that paper on on their server. Again, should be completely pro forma. It's not supposed to be a peer reviewed thing uh, until it was peer reviewed, because t- it was too dangerous for public health for people to have access to the the data and information and the and the, and the analysis that we put together. And, and, and so, this you, is in so you you and I got together and decided, well, let's write all this up. And, 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 uh, you know, the kind of censorship that was going on. And, and we led, by the way, with uh, the title of Chapter 11 of Frederick von Hayek's famous book, The Road to Serfdom. The title is The End of Truth. So, <laughs> so now let's jump ahead to the most two, two very recent things. A couple of days ago, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, Wrote a letter to at the request uh, to a committee in Congress, and and he he did indicate that the White House was trying to strong arm Facebook and and, and his operation with regard to COVID. Now it's kind of a wishy washy letter. Why why he didn't blow the whistle on the White House before and and say you know stop st- strong arming us? He claims they never did anything in response. I, I think that's a lot of bull because they I mean, we, we, part, we know part, we know that's a lie. Part, part we, of the we, fact we checkers, by the way, that were fact checking me, work for Facebook. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's a trusted news network, trusted news initiative. Um, you know, uh, that is it's shocking actually. That's so 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 sorry, so ahead. the Zuckerberg letter. He he finally admitted the White House was strong arming him. He he claim, claims he was Mister Clean, never doing anything about it so forth. Anyway, that, that's one thing. The other thing is just yesterday in the New York Times, this gets into part of the lockdown thing was masking. Remember mask? Well, now it's illegal to wear a mask in public in New York. They just arrested some guy in New York. This was in yesterday's New York Times for wearing a mask. So that, that's, that's, how, that's, how, that's how far things have changed. I think pe- things have moved. I mean, the, 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 I have to say, I was quite frustrated with the, with the letter from Zuckerberg because I, I've been involved in a lawsuit against the Biden administration um, called the Missouri versus Biden lawsuit. Uh, and in discovery, we just we we found emails from from Facebook uh, from from the White House itself to Facebook, essentially threatening Facebook that if they didn't censor the kinds of ideas that the government that the government didn't want put on that platform that, that they would, you know, in effect, they would punish them. Um, the, I mean, the, and you know, often it was an implicit threat, but the threat was there. And you can see these internal emails within the Facebook trust and safety people where they, they're, they're like, what do we do? Oh my- 